Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ankush. I am a student at Purdue University. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about our project on uh, 4G and 5G cellular paging protocols and how we prevent them against security and privacy attacks. So let's just jump right into it. So first, let's look at the functioning of the paging procedure and why is it required for cellular networks. So every cellular device is provided with the permanent IMZ number or an international mobile subscriber identity by the core network. The cellular device uses this IMZ to connect to the core network through the base station. And after the mutual authentication, a TMZ number is provided to the cellular device. This is a temp temporary mobile subscriber identity that is used for any subsequent communication by the cellular device. So this is when the device gets connected, but after a period of certain inactivity, the cellular device goes into an idle phase where it doesn't repeatedly check for the incoming transmissions from the base station. This is done to prevent uh, battery consumption on the cellular device side. So what happens in case there is an incoming service like an SMS or a call for the cellular device? What happens is core network sends a paging request to the base station and then base station pro pro uh, creates a paging message with all the TMZs and IMZs of the cellular devices which have a pending incoming service. So these uh, cellular devices periodically check these paging messages and if they find their TMZ number or, an, or IMZ number inside that paging message, they initiate the connection back to the core network. And this is how they can uh, get that service. So Let's look at how this actually works. So any cellular device in the idle mode uh, stops checking for any incoming transmission from the base station and periodically wakes up at a certain frame index number or what we call as paging occasion to check for any pending services like calls or SMSs. So how does the cellular device uh, know its paging occasion or how does the base station know the paging occasion for every cellular device it does so by using the last eight bits of the imz number so now if you remember from the last slide imz number is the permanent identity provided to each cellular device by the core network so any two cellular devices having the same last eight bits of the imz number will have the same paging occasion and will wake up at the same uh, paging frame index to check for any pending services so the question in front of us is, can a passive adversary that only knows victim's phone number or a Twitter handle or any social media account, can they identify and track the victim's presence in a certain area? And the answer is yes. This can be done using the torpedo attack. To execute the torpedo attack, an attacker generates silent phone calls to the victim's phone number or generates social media notifications for the cellular device, uh, for the victim cellular device, so that the base station has to send paging messages to that cellular device. So the attacker collects the distribution of paging messages in that certain area when there were no phone calls being made, uh, and then collects the distribution of the paging messages when the silent phone calls have, uh, are being made to the victim. So if he notices a certain spike on a certain paging occasion, the attacker can conclude that the victim is present in that area. And this also leaks the last eight bits of the IMZ of the cellular device. Once uh, the paging occasion of a certain victim is revealed, the torpedo attack also enables uh, targeted paging channel hijacking attacks and broadcasting fake emergency broadcast messages to that victim. In addition to this, uh, Torpedo also enables profiling cell level mobility or basically tracking the movement of a particular cellular device through various areas. Let's look at some of the design vulnerabilities in the paging procedure that allow these attacks to happen. The first one is that the temporary identifier TMZ for each cellular device is being sent in plain text in these paging messages and is not being updated frequently by the cellular network providers as uh, suggested by 3GPP. 
So what happens is uh, this TMZ is assigned and then it's not updated after a certain interval or with every new connection. So this allows for prolonged exposure uh, of the TMZ and location tra tracking of the victims uh, for a long period of time. The second problem uh, with the paging procedure is that the paging occasion is fixed. As we discussed in the previous slides, the occasion when the device wakes up to check for it, any pending services, uh, it's based on the last eight bits of the IMZ. And as we know, IMZ is a permanent identifier and it's not updated once it's assigned to a cellular device. The third problem uh, with the paging procedure here is the lack of authentication. So there is no provision for authentication of the paging messages by the cellular devices. Uh, any attacker can set up a fake base station and start injecting uh, torpedo uh, or, and start injecting uh, tsunami warnings or earthquake warnings and the cellular device would have no way to verify whether this is coming from an authentic source or not. We first introduced an ephemeral identifier that we call pseudo TMZ uh, that replaces TMZs inside of paging messages. The biggest problem as we discussed with TMZs was that the cellular providers do not update it frequently enough which allows for location tracking and other different attacks. The biggest reason for the cellular providers not updating TMZ is it requires extra communication steps or extra authenticated and encrypted communication steps uh, for a single updation. Instead, the pseudo TMZ identifier that we introduce does not require any extra steps for updating, uh, up updating the identifier. So to set up pseudo TMZ, the base station sends a random 32-bit seed K uh, during the attach procedure. Both the base station and the cellular device use this K and a cryptographically secure pseudo random gen number generator to generate two identical lists of PTMZs. We propose two different strategies to update the PTMZ depending on the computational efficiency requirements of the particular cellular networks. So in the first approach, the PTMZ is refreshed after each paging cycle, whether or not an actual paging message is being sent in that paging cycle or not. So as you can see here, after every paging cycle, the base station and the UE update their PTMZ values even though there is no paging message that is being sent during that paging cycle. Now, if there is a paging request uh, during a particular paging cycle, the base station checks the current PTMZ and generates a paging message uh, with the identified PTMZ3 that corresponds to the current uh, PTMZ value of that particular UE. In the second approach, uh, which is more computationally efficient, we propose updating the PTMZs only after an actual paging message is received by the cellular device. So in this case, uh, the core network, uh, which we represent by the MME here, uh, and the UE maintain these lists instead, instead of the base station and the UE. So the MME, whenever there is a paging request, it uses that identifier PTMZ to send to the base station and the base station basically relays this information to the cellular device. After this actual paging request is received by the UE, both the UE and the MME refresh their PTMZ values to the next value. To prevent against the torpedo attack uh, caused by a static paging occasion, we uh, introduced variable paging occasion by basing the calculation of the paging occasion itself on the newly introduced ephemeral PTMZ instead of the static IMZ as was previously done. So, the paging occasions would be constantly refreshed as soon as the cellular device gets a new PTMZ uh, based on the strategies that we just discussed in the previous two slides, either after every paging cycle or after a new paging message is received uh, by the cellular device. Last but not the least, we provide message authentication for the paging messages to give a way for the cellular devices to authenticate whether the paging messages that they are receiving are coming from a legitimate base station deployed by their cellular network provider and not by a fake base station that is being controlled uh, by an attacker. 
So there are several uh, ways uh, to enable message authentication. The first and the, for, uh, the first and the most simplest is symmetry key based authentication schemes. Uh, these are generally message authentication codes and even though they are very efficient, they are not ideal for large scale broadcast authentication as they basically require pairwise secret keys for every signer and verifier. This adds sort of significant management and storage overhead to maintain and distribute all these keys. This makes it infeasible for deployment uh, for a cellular network scenario. Another type of authentication schemes are asymmetric key based authentication schemes or digital signatures. These are scalable and also provide public verifiability without the need for pairwise secret keys. However, they incur a significant performance overhead as they involve expensive cryptographic operations. And this may slow down the signing and the verification process and thus impact the quality of service of the cellular network. We use the Tesla broadcast authentication scheme, which is a happy balance between the asymmetric and the symmetric key based schemes. Tesla uses efficient symmetric key based uh, primitives. However, it provides asymmetric key based uh, properties by using delayed key disclosure. Let's see how that works. The Tesla broadcast authentication mechanism requires a one way key chain, which in our scenario is generated and maintained by the base station. During the bootstrapping phase, the base station generates key K0 and uses a pseudo random function F to generate K1. This step is performed repeatedly to generate this keychain. Now this keychain is reversed and revealed in the reverse order of generation. So whenever a new UE or a cellular device uh, connects to a base station, the base station during the attach procedure sends the K current or the current key to the UE. The Tesla protocol instantiated for the cellular networks or P-Tesla as we call it works in the following way. For every paging cycle, the base station uses the corresponding key to sign any paging messages that are appearing in that paging cycle. So in this example, key 100 is being used for the paging cycle 100 to sign this paging message and the resulting MAC is stored inside that paging message. Now, once the cellular device receives this paging message, it would save this MAC inside its memory, but it cannot yet verify this MAC because it does not have key 100. Now, key 100 is revealed in the next message. If you look at the bottom of the paging message, key 100 is being revealed in the paging cycle 101. So during the paging cycle 101, the cellular device would be able to authenticate any messages that it received in the previous paging cycle. And this process is repeated for every paging cycle. Now let's look at some of the results for the PTMZ refresh approaches that we suggested earlier. So as we can see here, the second approach, which is refreshing only after a paging message is received by a cellular device is much more efficient than the approach one where we refresh the PTMZ after each paging cycle. We require less number of elements in the PTMZ list LS. The time taken to generate or regenerate the list LS is low in both cases, but in case of the second approach, it, it is much lower than the first one. Again, the regeneration is required after 128 seconds in case of the first approach, which is the default value of 100 paging cycles. In case of the second approach, it depends on the number of actual notifications that, is, that are being received and the frequency of the notifications that are being received by the cellular devices. As we can see, the memory requirements for the MME or the core network, the base station and the UE are very minimal for both these approaches. In this slide, we compare the performance of our technique to other similar techniques that provide security against the attacks on paging procedures. The first technique is by Hussein et al, uh, who suggest adding fake paging messages uh, 
to the distribution by the base stations so that the attacker cannot see any frequency changes between the different paging occasions. The, th the 3 GPP proposal on the other hand suggests uh, refreshing the TMZ after every uh, new paging message is received by the UE and this requires a GUTI reallocation procedure which is an authenticated and encrypted exchange uh, between the core network and the and the cellular device. So as you can see, uh, approach one and three don't require any new fake paging messages injected by the base station. Approach two requires around 18,740 fake paging messages uh, injected by the base station during a 20 minute period that we observed. Uh, out of these 31 fake paging messages are received by the UE, which is sort of an extra overhead for each UE to process these paging messages. The third approach, the 3GPP approach requires GUTI reallocation procedure to be executed 10 times, whereas the other two approaches do not require any GUTI reallocation process to be executed. As we can see here, uh, our approach provides 937 uh, new PTMZ updates in case of policy one and 10 PTMZ updates in case of policy two, whereas uh, the third approach provides only 10 uh, PT, uh, 10 TMZ updates. When we talk about the battery drain, our approach introduces a very negligible battery drain as compared to more than 3000 milliampers and more than 1000 milliampers in case of approach two and three. In this slide, we introduce the results for P Tesla, which is the authentication scheme that we introduced for the paging messages. The base station requires only 14 milliseconds to generate a keychain of 10,000 keys. The time to sign a message is 0 0.0029 milliseconds as compared to the verification time of 0 0.0031 milliseconds, which are both very low. The communication overhead of this scheme for every paging message is 64 bits, which includes 32 bits for the Mac and the 32 bit and 32 bits for the actual signing key. The memory requirement for MME is zero bytes. The base station requires 40 kilobytes to maintain this keychain, whereas the UE requires no extra memory uh, for storing uh, any any of the keys here. The end-to-end -end delay is uh, 1,280 milliseconds, which is the period of a paging cycle, which is the default period for a paging cycle because we have to buffer the paging message till the next paging cycle before we can verify it. This introduces uh, a minimal uh, delay of just around just a little more than one second, which is acceptable in most cases. In the conclusion, let's look at some of the security guarantees that we provide as a result of deploying our defenses. First of all, the adversary is not able to confirm whether a user is present in the target area or not. Uh, so any kind of location tracking uh, due to paging messages is out of the picture. The second is that the adversary cannot learn any new information about the IMZ of the target UE. This is because we now don't base the calculation of the paging occasion on the IMZ of the device. Instead, we use an ephemeral identifier PTMZ that we introduced. And the last one is that the adversary cannot inject any fake paging messages or alerts without being detected. This is a, this is the result of adding the paging message authentication uh, techniques uh, for the cellular networks. I would like to thank you for listening to this talk and I would be happy to answer any of the questions that you might have.